Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden of Witts University in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, it has been a year since we last talked about racism, and boy, this past week it came back like a doozy. I mean, it's just, you know, it's one of these issues that, you know, racism, you'll, you'll, it'll be here with us for the end of time. And uh, this past week, we had two really serious incidents, which I think bring to light the difficulties that Chinese are having as they engage the rest of the world. In part, we'll talk about uh, a really tone-deaf museum exhibition that featured the juxtaposition of African animals with African people, and also... um, (laughs) You know, WeChat, I mean, it's just, it's, I'm laughing because it's just so funny. WeChat had the, uh, when you, they have this automatic translation feature. And when you press the automatic translation for Hei Lao Wai, which is uh, black foreigner, it came up as the N word. So we'll talk about both of those issues and what it means. And uh, it's really, I'm laughing because it just, we're not making any progress, which is really what's so discouraging here. It's really awful. <laughs> it's, uh, I was, I'm also laughing for the same reason. It's just so egregious and awful. And, you know, yeah, exactly. We, we're just kind of stuck in the mire. Um, yeah. <laughs> we're not moving and, and forward. We're not moving forward, but I guess in, in some ways it's important to have these conversations. And I think before we start this discussion, we should point out the fact that, you know, I come from a country which is, you know, four centuries into its history. Uh, you know, it's still struggling with racial issues in the United States. Uh, you obviously come from a country where race has defined the, 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 the past, you know, two, three hundred years. So, you know, we're not going to pretend that whatever we're talking about is easy to solve. Um, we're not going to pretend that we're necessarily going to, to criticize others. We want to bring the, the issues to light and to try to provide some context to why this is happening. So let's start with this museum exhibit. It was called This is Africa at the Hubei Provincial Museum in the city of Wuhan. And uh, now here it was, it was try to picture, and we'll put a, a video uh, on YouTube that, was, uh, that shows the exhibit. Now try to picture this, a whole exhibit of animals and people, you know, split screen, basically. And if there is a, um, you know, a lion, then there is a person who's growling like a lion. Now, in cases like that, okay, but then there were monkeys and there were other kind of primates and there were really, it was just jarring a, a, as insensitive as it was. Now, it was done by a photographer by, name, by the name of Yu Hui Ping, who's a construction uh, magnate. Apparently, he's traveled to Africa more than 20 times, and he's won all sorts of awards for his uh, photography work. And he's the vice chairman of the Hubei Photographers Association, if that matters. But I guess he's got a lot of connections in Guanxi, which is what allowed him to be able to to have this photo exhibit. Um, Tone deaf doesn't even begin to describe, I think, what it was. And so what was your reaction when you first saw it? Well... Okay, in the first place, you know, we have to make be clear that, you know, as as two white guys discussing race in the China Africa relationship, there's you know, there's a lot of things that we will probably even not not see, have no insight into. So take that to whatever we say with a, a grain of salt. Indeed, um, indeed, indeed. But I found it very, very clunky and also visually kind of ugly. Um, just in terms of, uh, there, there was no. It was just these kind of close crop close ups of the, the the of animal faces and then close up close ups of people's faces all smushed together into these kind of these two shots. Um, you know, and in in the one case, I think the one that's been circulated the most is a, is a small African boy kind of seemingly shouting and then a, a kind of echo, you know. Um, of uh, of a monkey's face. Um, that one I think is the most you know poster for racism, kind of really awful awful one that I've seen. A lot of the other ones, there is there seems to be very little relationship between the images. Um, you know, it's a kind of a middle aged man and then a lion, you know, next to him, and and it's it's difficult for me to necessarily see any kind of re- link between them, which made me think that the whole entire concept was based on the little boy picture, um, and. There is just, it's just, it's just awful, <laughs> you know, it's just ugly to look at and nasty and hateful. Now, obviously, the reaction online and in social media and around the world was of disgust and anger. And in here in China, uh, the African community spoke up vociferously and the, the exhibit was taken and shut down. 
Now, what a lot of Chinese people, their, you know, the reaction from their point of view, and I was looking on Chinese social media, there's a sense of confusion. And it was best articulated by uh, one of the exhibit's curators, uh, by a man by the name of Wang Yuejun. And he said that the comparisons to animals were typically seen as a compliment in Chinese culture. And that is that it's very typical in Chinese culture to take people's expressions and the zodiac signs, the 12 zodiac signs of different animals, and to compare them. So in, I just I think it's important to bring a little bit of the context, maybe, 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 and I'm not trying to justify what uh, Yu Huiping, the photographer, was trying to do, but it might give some insight to what he was actually thinking. By taking that in Chinese culture, comparing humans to animals is something that is a compliment. But obviously, when you do it in a black culture, when you do it to other cultures, something gets lost in translation. And I, you know, what, 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 you know, do you think that's a legitimate you know, point of view there? Um. You you see a similar kind of thing happening in colonial art sometimes in in Africa, where there is a a tendency in in a lot of colonial art of of kind of both depictions of African people and African animals are not necessarily condemning them in any way. They kind of a lot of it is couched in terms of we celebrating this kind of wild wild non European beauty, Um, and fine, sure. But the the problem is, is that that only works if you remain ignorant or willfully ignorant of the, an entire like multi-century discourse in which Africans were equated with animals and 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 where you know sure I mean you can say whatever whatever one wants about you know kind of traditional or different kinds of cultures love of animals but in most cultures uh, you know animals are are categorized as non-human that's what you are when you're not human so that kind of conflation has run for centuries and centuries in depictions of Africans and the only way that this kind of thing can work is if you remain completely ignorant of that tradition, which of course doesn't work because that tradition lives on. It does, but in China, they don't have that conflation. That is, particularly in an American narrative, um, blacks were equated as and treated and considered as animals. They were sold as livestock uh, f- during the period of slavery. And in fact, they were equated in, you know, in every way to an animal. And so to be debased like that is something that obviously people on the outside are very sensitive to. But here in China, they don't have that appreciation. Uh, again, not trying to excuse or justify what's happening here, but attempting to maybe put a little bit of cultural insight as to why this could happen and how it could happen. On our Facebook page, um, there is an interesting conversation that's been going on about this. Kobus posted the story earlier in the week. And uh, one of our commentators, uh, uh, Stella Hongzhang, she attempted also to try and put some context to this. And I'd like to, to read it. it. It was not well received by the community, as, you'll, as you can understand. But here's what she said, and I'd like to get your take on this, Kobus. While I have no intention to deny that racism against Africans is a serious problem in China, I do think it is possible to interpret this exhibition in a non-racist way. The photographer's intention was to highlight that animals have emotions like humans do, and it occurred to him as an appropriate to use Africans' images to represent humans in the juxtaposition with African animals. What's your thought there? Uh, I don't buy it because why then not? For example, I mean, you have you have a billion different faces in the world. Why not mix them up? Like why why are those emotions particularly located in Africans? Um, you know, and you know, I guess from the name of the exhibit and so on, there there, there tends to be this this attempt to kind of make it the the different faces of Africa essentially. But that itself is problematic you know because because the you know the exhi- exhibition itself has a kind of a flattening of the diversity of faces that you see among african people so yeah i just i just don't i don't agree with her okay the, the second part of her comment goes on true the chinese are just too ignorant of and sensitive to the racism debates elsewhere in the world to realize that the framing of the exhibition can be read in an extremely offensive way But I would like to suggest that there is a possibility that the photographer and the organizer didn't mean it. Could it be an expression of their subconscious racism? I don't know. Possibly. And on that point, I'm actually going to agree with her. Because do they understand the racist implications of this exhibit? I genuinely don't think they do. I mean, I really don't think they do. Sure, but at the same time, I mean, if you if if one only blamed, if one only condemned racist depictions that were that were put out there to explicitly insult people, then you have quite a, a relatively small sample, right? Kind of, it's, it's because then you're like dealing with the the, the likes of the 
of the kind of alt right and you know like Daily Stormer or whatever like like you know, people who put out explicitly racist things in order to hurt people's feelings. The bulk of racist depictions are ex- in exactly this way, kind of bumbling people stumbling into into these kind of sub subliminal um, subconscious kind of coral reefs that that structure the way that they think um, you know so I think the, the the bulk of racism actually is is this kind of racism where people don't actively try to offend someone but then end up offending people anyway and and and, and to a certain extent they're worse because you know because they you know they, they show how unexamined much of this still is and I mean at the same time I just I just wanted to get your take on this so when I was recently in China, and um, and there was an interesting kind of I attended a lecture on shared histories of colonialism. Um, you know how how the experience of of colonialism in China, you know, kind of makes it easier for China to to relate to Africa, which is obviously a a, a theme that we hear a lot in China Africa relations. And the one example that was cited in that um, in that lecture, not the only one I've heard that many times, is the British colonial era um, sign in Hong Kong, the the infamous sign of no no dogs and no Chinese allowed. Um, so you know this kind of conflation of of animality with race, you know, when when it when it kind of gets when it happens in a in a context where your own country is colonized, then it's easy to condemn, right? Kind of then then you know kind of the, there's no there's no confusion about about the racism in in that case. But once it kind of it, it moves slightly further away and it's Africans involved, then suddenly it becomes impossible to understand. I, I just don't buy it. Yeah, no, and and, and I'll. Just on, on two key points here. One is that the telling of history is also very important here, is that I think that in the telling of history of black slavery in the United States, the equation with animals has been something that has carried through the narrative to the present day. And interestingly, the telling of history of Chinese slavery in the United States, the Chinese built the California railroads, they were enslaved, they were treated on, on par with, uh, with African Americans, uh, particularly in the West, in Los Angeles and San Francisco. Uh, but th- that history has been lost for, th- for the most part. Uh, and it's not something celebrated in Chinese history the way it is in other parts. Celebrated, I mean, in a negative way. Um, in the sense of, you know, here in, in, in colonialism done by the Europeans in China, in Hong Kong, in Macau, um, it's not dwelled upon anywhere near, for example, the way that Japanese colonialism is. And so I think the telling of the history is very, very different, which relates to the fact that I don't think people have a collective memory of Western colonialism in China the way they do, say, of Japanese colonialism here. And, and as a result, I think there's something very, very interesting here. And this goes to your point that, yes, the kind of hidden racism is the most insidious because it's more, much more pervasive. And I think the, the big problem here was that there was nobody to say, you know what, this isn't a good idea. And when you live in a country that is 92% the same ethnicity, um, and there is a a collectivism here in terms of not publicly criticizing others, particularly people who are, you know, construction magnates who are very wealthy, uh, who put on photography exhibits like this, um, there's just nobody who stood up and said, this is a bad idea. And just to show that the Chinese aren't alone in doing this, you know, you know, our show this week is This Week in Racism, right? Um, our friends at the Dove Soap Company in the United States, they too ran into a very similar problem where they, ha- they released an ad this past week, which was almost identical in nature to the racist detergent ad in China last year that you and I talked about, where in, if you recall from that ad, the idea was there was a, a Chinese woman she had her boyfriend, who was a black African, who put into a washing machine, she put in the detergent, and out came a kind of pale-skinned Han Chinese. And the idea was, wow, you can make it clean. Well, Dove this week uh, did something very similar, where a, I think it was an African-American woman kind of takes off her shirt and she becomes a white woman. And the idea, of course, is that Dove will make you cleaner. Dove now faced two challenges on this. One was that visualization, but two, they said on their product, normal to darker skin. So the product is ideal for normal to darker skin, implying, of course, that darker skin is not normal. Now, this is 2017 in the United States, and they are still struggling with this issue. Again, I am not trying to suggest that the Chinese should be left off the hook for this at all, but just to suggest that these are extraordinarily complicated issues that societies like yours and mine are still struggling with. 
Yes, and to to be you know, I I find the the Dove ad incredibly dumb and 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 objectionable, but not I don't find it as objectionable as the exhibit, for the only reason that the the rest of the ad is is, is the ad is essentially a three shot ad. So you see you see a black woman with a t shirt that matches her skin tone, then she pulls the t shirt over her head and she essentially turns into a white lady with a with a kind of a pale buff t shirt who then pulls another t shirt over her head and she turns into who seems like maybe Hispanic woman um, with a kind of a beige t-shirt. So I hate this. It's really, really dumb. But I don't find it maybe as as racist as I do the exhibit. Um, what, what do you there's think? A commonality. You do? There's a yeah. commonality between the two. And, yes. and, and, and what I will say is that, again, the lack of diversity in the people making the decisions about both the ad and the exhibit there was nobody there that said, you know what, this isn't a good idea. Okay, well, this is what I wanted to ask you actually, because so so I'm you know I'm working at a at a media studies university department, which means this is ground zero for kind of critiquing this kind of thing. Um, but you've you've put in a lot of time in actual ad agencies. So so how does this actually work in the boardroom? Like how do how do these decisions get made? So, you know, working in advertising, there's a long process that leads up to this type of, uh, of ad that goes, that goes live. It goes through evaluations. It goes from the creative to the client, back to the creative, back to the client, back to the creative. I mean, there's probably 200 back and forths uh, before they actually decide to release the ad. These are not done quickly. They're done carefully. They're done with lots of data behind them. There's well thought through. The problem is, though, if you have one group of people who are, or a, a predominance of one group of people, whether that's a cultural predominance, whether that is a racial predominance, whatever it is, and no one is saying, you know what, this is not going to be well received, that ad can fly through all of those checks. And that's probably what happened, in my guess, is that nobody sat there and said, you know what, this community, my community is not going to be well, not going to receive this very well. And as a result, on social media, everybody sees it very quickly. So I suspect that this was not something that was done haphazardly. This was actually done with an enormous amount of thought, of data, of evaluation, consideration. But the lack of diversity is really the problem here. And that is the problem in China. And so that brings us up to another issue that came out, which is WeChat. Now, for people outside of China, they don't really know WeChat too well, but WeChat is, in fact, the second largest social media network in the world. Facebook, of course, being number one with two billion users. Uh, WeChat has 900 million users, most of them in China. Now, WeChat is a social network. It is a payment system. It is a chat. It is, it's everything. It's an Uber app, if you will. And uh, now, it, it, there's a feature on WeChat, which is very, very cool, actually, if you don't speak Chinese. You, you click on the Chinese characters, and it does an automatic translation. And uh, it was discovered <laughs> that when people were writing the, the three characters for Hei Lao Wai, which is, Lao Wai is the kind of derogatory word for foreigner. Uh, it's kind of a, not, not a necessarily a rude word, it's a kind of a, a minor slang um, and then he is black, so black foreigner. And when you kind of pressed on the words black foreigner, he la wai, those three characters, uh, WeChat automatically translated that into the N word. <laughs> uh, I mean, and, how and, and, did this happen? <laughs> now, what WeChat will tell you, WeChat will tell you that it was they're blaming uh, the error on artificial intelligence. Now that says, so they're saying humans are not involved in our translation. So it brings us back to, do you remember a couple years ago, Microsoft had a very similar problem with the Kinect, their, their game system, that it didn't recognize black people. And they said it's based on the algorithms. It's not human that made those decisions. Oh, I was actually thinking of a different Microsoft. I, I, was it Microsoft? I can't remember. A, a, a big Silicon Valley company started an AI where they used social media to social media inputs where the AI was teaching itself to speak. And then within within a few within a few weeks, this, the AI turned into this like horrible Nazi racist was, nightmare, having just like, absorbed everything on Twitter. Um, and <laughs> that was what I was what what because that was that's what I wanted to know more about actually about how this algorithm worked because did the, was was the algorithm self learning in terms of user you know kind of you like absorbing um, like real text messages in the world or like what was the kind of glitch that came on in specifically that I didn't 100% now, get I, I will have to ask somebody from WeChat and I suspect people are not at WeChat are probably not going to talk to you and me and the rest of the world about this they say now that it has been corrected but this says one of two things 
either this was some kind of you know sick joke by a programmer at at WeChat. That's entirely possible, which is owned by Tencent, which is partially owned by Nashpers of South Africa. Um, that's possible, or it really was an artificial intelligence issue. And what the algorithms do is they will go out on onto the you know basically into the vast world of networks, and they will take the characters Wai, you know black foreigner, and they will say what does this mean. And they will try and find as many kind of comparisons to those three characters in the definition. And then it comes back and it says, this means this. So it's entirely possible as well that WeChat was, was being honest and saying, listen, the word went out into the network and the network came back saying the N-word. Yeah. Which again that goes back to what we you were saying. Basically we live in this broken world and, and WeChat is reflecting our broken world back to us. There we go, too. So that is also a possibility as well. And it reflects the broader racism that exists in society that WeChat is simply reflecting in their algorithmic translation. Impossible to know. We will probably never know. But I want to bring up another issue to you. What kind of damage do you think this kind of incident will have as WeChat tries to make its entry into Africa? Um, I have to say, I I didn't see a lot of coverage about this issue um, in the in the African press. So the fact that they managed to fix it quickly, uh, you know, you know, I think it would there will be probably be some damage, but. I, I think the bigger, the, the, I think WeChat faces bigger, bigger challenges in Africa than that particular problem. Um, especially if the problem doesn't recur, like you, other issues, like for example, the the complete market dominance of WhatsApp in in the South African market. I think will be, and just the way that that uh, uh, like WhatsApp and and Facebook chat have been kind of in, integrated in people's everyday lives on a level that WeChat is going to be, you know, find hard to to replicate. I think that will probably be a big issue. Interesting. So WeChat, and this, this issue brings up one final point that I'd like to make on this, on this broader issue of racism and cultural homogeneity and the difficulties that I think Chinese companies are going to face as they go out into the world looking for new markets. Companies like WeChat are facing a very big problem here in China, and that is the fact that the market's been saturated. Everybody who can have a WeChat account has one now in China. There is no more growth to be had. It's done. Uh, so in order for these companies to continue to grow, they have to look for new markets. And those markets are overseas. And the Chinese, because they don't have a lot of cultural, ethnic, linguistic, national diversity in their management ranks, Alibaba may be the exception there. But for the most part, a lot of these companies are very, very insular. And as a result of being insular, they make these mistakes over and over and over again. And I think it's going to be one of the biggest impediments that challenge Chinese companies as they make inroads into places like Africa, into the United States, Europe, and elsewhere. I agree, and but I think it's it's even a bigger problem than that because China isn't the only insular country out there, um, you know. And and this this kind of insular racism is also a part of African life. Um, so I, I think I think it's important to to widen this debate beyond, especially the the, the role of Africans in this debate beyond, you know, kind of appalled and offended person on on social media um, because okay so so the, the reason I'm, the reason I'm saying this is there was a there was an incident about two weeks ago in South Africa where there was a big demonstration uh, by the the Congress of South African trade unions which is this umbrella organization representing a, a, a large number of trade unions massively politically influential in South Africa, like a real, one of the biggest power players in the country, um, representing thousands and thousands of workers. So there's this kind of massive rally um, in, the, in the center of Joburg. They want to hand over a set of, a memorandum in relation to, you know, like listing their, their set of grievances. It was part of a strike action. And they need to hand that over to the mayor of the country, or mayor of, or mayor of Johannesburg, I mean. So the mayor of Johannesburg is in a meeting, um, and, he, so, and he can't attend, and he sends a deputy who's on the, the 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 council, who is a Chinese South African, um, you know, a, a South African citizen of Chinese descent, who works for the council in Johannesburg. This person then gets shouted at by the entire thousand, many many thousands of of protesters and the leaders, and get called Fong Kong which is South African slang for a, a cheap Chinese imitation or a, a Chinese fake, um, and. You know, and then you know, World War Three ensues on social media, and a, f a few days later, this this trade union grudgingly apologizes. So, 
the, this thing, this this kind of judging people just simply on what they look at, you know, conflating them with the national image, conflating them with with some kind of like old idea of what their country is like. This isn't just happening in China; it's happening in Africa, um, and it's you know it's it's a, it's a problem. <laughs> like as, as as you know, as more and more Chinese companies come into Africa, they're going to be hitting a lot more of this. And, and I think that's a good point to end our discussion. Is that if you find me a country where they have figured out racial tolerance, I will give you 10 bucks because um, I don't think it exists. I mean, racial injustice, racial prejudice is something that all countries deal with and all societies deal with. Um, even, you know, my wife is from Sweden and Sweden has long kind of pr- promoted itself as a bastion of tolerance and they are struggling right, right now. Uh, so I don't think that there's anywhere that has, that has figured this out. Uh, China is, encom- is encountering it now in different ways because it's becoming more engaged with the rest of the world. And it's also because of social media, it's now the, the rest of the world has a say in a way that the Chinese, I think, are unaccustomed to. Uh, but as you pointed out in South Africa, it's also a... Uh, uh, you know, an issue that that continues to plague the discussion as much as it does in my country in the United States. So I think uh, this is a, a fascinating discussion. I suspect, Cobus, this isn't the last time. Maybe it'll be another year or two before we come back to this topic, but I doubt Let's it. Hope. Um, <laughs> but nonetheless, it, it does raise some very interesting issues, and it forces a discussion that we wouldn't ordinarily have. And for that, I'm grateful for these types of uh, of incidents because it allows us to bring some some things that are under the surface above. Uh, in all contexts, again, the fact that you and I are two white guys talking about this uh, only adds to the discussion because no one has a monopoly on the truth here. Certainly we don't, uh, and, and, and we don't pretend to. We're just trying to kind of engage a conversation with you, our listeners, and each other, and trying to find uh, an understanding and a better solution to this. So. Uh, so that'll do it for this edition of the show. Um, if you'd like to join the discussion, you'd see what uh, Stella Hongjian wrote on our Facebook page, go look for the post on facebook.com slash China Africa Project. Of course, Kobus and I are on all the various social media channels, which we'll give all the details at the end of the show. But uh, we'd love to to have you join our discussion. Uh, find me on LinkedIn as well, where we're talking a lot about these, these different issues. Uh, what do you think? Do you think the Chinese are to blame? Do you think there are, there are reasons behind this? Or is this just simply inexcusable and should be called uh, inexcusable right up there and just that's it. So uh, we'll be back again next week with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. For Kobus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show or follow China Africa News that's updated every four hours, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadenesk or Eric at Eolander. That's E-O-L-A-N-D-E-R. Subscribe to the China Africa podcast on iTunes or download the mobile apps for iOS, Android, or Windows Phone. Just head over to your favorite store and search for China Africa. China Africa.